Um, so I'm really excited about my talk today, um, and hopefully it won't be too redundant, and there's a bit of a segue from, from the, the, some of the talks this morning, in that I'm going to bring in inspiration from the natural world and inspiration from the world of science fiction. Um, I don't really like title slides, so that was actually my title slide. So we'll just zip through that. Because what I want to talk to you guys today about is this idea of creativity. And creativity is something that we normally associate with the intangible. It's the masters, right? As you can see here, you know, we have the weeping woman from Picasso. The masters have creative. They look at the world with this creative eye that us normal folks don't really have. It's either that or creativity is, is associated with the uninhibited imagination of youth. Elephant by my four-year-old daughter, Mara. <laughs> so this idea of creativity, what is it? Why is it this thing that we are afraid of? Okay? And in fact, some of the masters thought this way as well. Creativity takes courage. This is a quote from Matisse. This doesn't really help me. Not only do I not feel creative, but I know I'm not courageous. Sorry, courageous. That's a new word. <laughs> Nor am I courageous. So, really, why is creativity this proverbial monster in the closet? And what I really want to do is take a walk through science fiction and movie monsters as a way of taking a new look at creativity and how creativity in this genre is inspired by and just made tangible from the world around us. This idea of going to the movies, going to a place where we can sit down and be taken away into the fantastic, the surreal, is something we're all attracted to. Monsters in the movies is historic, has historical longevity. You know, King Kong, Godzilla battling Mothra, the Kraken emerging, coming out and destroying a pirate ship or a bridge, or the movies making things like the Kraken with Clash of the Titans. Greek mythology is now there and tangible to us. Or it's something that, more recently, science fiction can bring dinosaurs back to life. Or alien meteors, cosmic rays can make a seemingly harmless Venus flytrap into something as scary and awful as Audrey II. But the reality is, movie monsters are just an application of creativity. I'm going to start off with a few examples. And the first one here is Godzilla. Now, Godzilla's had some traction in the movies. And it's something that we can all sort of relate to, right? So we all know about, I said Godzilla. This is King Kong. <laughs> I'm glad you guys caught that. <laughs> Perfection is not a reality. OK, that's another whole talk. The idea of, of King Kong scaling um, the Empire State's building and swatting at airplanes is rather, you know, fantastic. But the fact that, you know, in 1933 and again, you know, in, in the early 2000s, I think it was 2005, we bring King Kong back to life. It has this historical attraction and traction in the movies. And taking a gorilla, something that we know exists, and making it into a movie monster isn't that far-fetched. It's not that fantastic. In fact, you could see it here in relation to a dinosaur. We know they existed. In this depiction, this gorilla would be about 25 feet tall. That's not really, in the grand scheme of the natural world, that big. The tallest giraffe that we know of was around 20 feet tall. They have physiological mechanisms to allow for that. Now, King Kong being this big, the reality of him actually standing up, and moving around may be a little fantastic. He could possibly get up and shuffle a little bit. But of course then, the caloric requirements of an animal this big is another whole entity. 
If we make an analogy to the modern male gorilla that we know of, they eat about an eighth of their body weight every day. So that would mean King, King Kong here would require about 15,000 Big Macs, or for the vast undergraduates in the audience, that's about 65,000 Pop-Tarts. <laughs> I don't think that could really happen. But the fact that the movies is taking a gorilla and making it larger than life is not that big of a step. But if we go into the genre of science fiction, that's when things seem a little more creative, a little more fantastic, a little more surreal. And these adjectives are something that I'm just going to be coming back to and back to and back to in this talk. And the next part of my talk, what I'm going to do now is sort of use these three movies, the Predator movies, the Aliens movies, and of course, the Star Wars franchise. You can't talk about science fiction without getting into the Star Wars franchise as examples of how creativity in the movies is an analogy and a link to the natural world around us. So what we're going to do now is start with the Predator movies. You can't go wrong if you have Arnold Schwarzenegger in your movie, right? So, and you can't go wrong if you have this alien species, this predatory species that lives for the thrill of the hunt, and it can reach out and grab Arnold by the throat. But what I really want to get at is when you peel this alien armor off, and you get at the face of the real predator. And I'm not actually talking about this face. I'm talking about, I'll pause. If there's anyone who's arachnophobic or a little bit squeamish in the audience, this is your chance to exit. I'm talking about this face. <laughs> this is the face of a dragonfly nymph. You've all seen dragonflies. Dragonflies are pretty much living all over the world. Okay? They have these aerial adults that in themselves are quite predatory. They are very beneficial to us. They eat a lot of nuisance insects like mosquitoes. But it is their aquatic nymphs that I see the real inspiration for the predator monster. They're really quite diverse, but they all share a very similar feeding morphology. Like the sci-fi analog, the predator, they are sit and wait predators but they have this amazing morphology on their heads that allows them to literally reach out and grab someone. As you can see here, here's their eyes and their antennae. They are true insects. But the morphology of their mouths, on the upper part, they have a labrum and two mandibles that chew their food up. But it's this amazing extension of their labium, or their lower jaw, sometimes called the mask, that it makes them really able to grab prey that are quite a bit bigger than themselves. Dr. Ern warned me this may happen. Next slide, please. There we go. Okay, it's working now. They literally can grab prey that are bigger than themselves. This is an insect now eating small fish, and even large tadpoles. So the reality of the predator reaching out and grabbing Arnold is not that fantastic. We can find it in the real world. Now, of course, we just talked about the predator movies and the predator space monster alien. We can't talk about the predators without talking about now the aliens. Now, the alien is when I get really passionate about the application of the natural world. These critters are cool, right? And what's really amazing is, is we're all familiar now with the way their jaw opens up, and then, of course, it has the jubble daw, the, the, double, the jubble daw, the double jaw extension as it comes out and really freaks the audience out. This is not that fantastic. There are predatory organisms on the planet that have the same morphology just like that dragonfly nymph can reach out and grab, grab someone. Okay? This is actually a very voracious predatory polychaete. Now, polychaete are just multi-legged worms. They're typically marine. This particular species 
lives in the, in the deep ocean off the coast of New Zealand, down in the marine sediments, and it has this amazing double jaw. So things that you think are highly creative and surreal in the aliens monsters, we actually find here on this planet. But it goes on, this analogy to our natural world goes on with the aliens. They have a caste system, and that just means that different morphs fill a different role in the colony, in the community. So here we have a queen morph. Here's her distended abdomen. She is literally an egg-producing machine. We have worker morphs that help and nursemaid the queen and also sort of take care of things. And then, of course, we have soldier morphs that go out and protect the colony. This is directly analogous to the casteism we see in termites and ants. Termites, here's a termite queen. Here's her head and her body and her large distended abdomen. She, again, is simply an egg-laying machine. There's also workers. They clean the colony. They construct the colony. They tend to that queen. And then, of course, there's also soldier morphs. Enlarged head, really big mandibles. They are out there protecting. But it's an extension of this, and it's really the alien life cycle that gets me all happy. Because the alien life cycle is directly analogous to some of my favorite creatures that we find here on Earth. So here's the egg. Every good thing starts from an egg. And from that egg, we get the crawler. Okay? And, and of course, in the, in the aliens' movies, this is the vector, right? This is the parasitizing morph. And Unfortunate to our species, we're the ones that typically become the hosts for the aliens. This is the, the warning slide, because we're getting into some gore next. Okay. This then parasitizes the host. The next stage in the life cycle, of course, is the chest buster. <laughs> very, very aptly named. It develops inside the human host and busts out of the chest cavity and then soonly develops into the adult alien that we know and love. This again seems, wow, that's so creative, that's so surreal, that is so fantastic. But in reality, it's inspired by the life cycle of something we call parasitoids. These are wasps and flies that literally parasitize and use hosts in a very similar life cycle as the alien's monster. Parasitoid diversity is huge. Here you see multiple parasitoids that have emerged and spun cocoons off this poor little caterpillar. And they range in size. This particular wasp is emerging out of a moth egg. These eggs are literally a diameter. Sorry, the diameter of these eggs is about a millimeter across. This is a wasp. The adult is emerging out of a one millimeter diameter egg. Of course, they also get to the other extreme. This is what we call a giant ichneumon. And you can see the lovely morphology of her ovipositor, literally her stinger. And she can push that through wood the width of a two by four. <laughs> and what she does is she parasitizes wood boring beetle larvae. Highly, highly beneficial to us. But it is the next life stages that really are so super cool. So back to my favorite animal on the planet, Aphidius irvi. She, this lovely little lady here, is a parasitic wasp. She parasitizes aphids, particularly something we call the pea aphid, which is a pest in agricultural fields. This is how she does it. She doesn't have a crawler stage. She's actually quite flexible. And what you can see here is, here is her head and her antenna. This is her thorax and her wings. And what she's done is extended her abdomen out through her legs, and is implanting an egg on the back of the head of this poor little baby aphid. Now, I know you've been saving your oohs and ahs, so now we get into the baby pictures. This is a baby parasitic wasp, a grub. They eat their host from the inside out. Now, but here's where the intelligence and this, this creativity comes in. They have to live and grow and develop inside this little insect. So they eat all the non-essential things first. Smart, right? Like the ovaries, because it's not going to live to reproduce. <laughs> and they literally eat it from the inside out. Now, 
And you saw other parasitoids that, you know, emerged out and spun a cocoon for the further development. Well, Aphidius irvi doesn't quite do that. It's a little more intelligent. It's living inside an insect that has a chitinous exoskeleton. Why waste energy on spinning another cocoon? What they actually do is take the chitinous exoskeleton of the aphid and make it into literally what we call the scientific term here, a mummy. And that is now the puparium or the cocoon for the parasitic wasp. And then the adult carves this perfectly circular emergence hole and out flies the adult. That is super cool. But again, as I said before, we can't talk about the sci-fi genre without talking about the Star Wars franchise. Thank you, Mr. Lucas. Thanks for selling out to Disney. Okay. <laughs> what I want to talk about is one of the coolest sci-fi animals out there, sandworms, in this particular case, the sarlacc. Now, it's, it's, you know, in this artist's rendition, it's the smallest of the sandworms out there, but only for what you see above ground. The best-known sarlacc is, of course, on the sand dunes of Tatooine, and it's where Jabba the Hutt takes Luke to meet his untimely demise. The sarlacc pit is literally just a gaping maw that we see out there in this sand dune. It has these lovely, lovely tentacles and downward-facing teeth, so prey can't get away. And then, of course, in the, 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 the remastered, digitally remastered versions, it added these lovely trap jaws. This is amazing and this is cool, but we actually find things like this here on planet Earth. Of course, this is a, a, when you get into the Star Wars genre, people take it to the utmost. And so this is an artist's rendition of what the body of the Sarlacc would look like and all of its digestive pits and everything else. But the sarlacc itself could very well have been inspired by ant lions, creatures from the family Mermeliontidae. It literally means ant lion. These larvae dig pits and trap ants and grab them with jaws and suck them dry. Okay? This is our beastie right here. This is the larva of an ant lion. The diversity of these things is really quite amazing. They are ubiquitous in their distribution. They're found on every sort of you know, thawing outside of Antarctica. They're found on every continent. So literally, these little movie monsters can be in your backyard. But it is the, is, is the nymphs and the larvae that I really want to concentrate on here. Because what they do is build these wonderful little pits. And sometimes they're solo, sometimes they're in a vast array kind of like a minefield for ants to be walking along, okay? And at the bottom of this is death, the ant lion larva. And I actually have an embedded little clip here that I want to show you of how the ant lion larva really captures these ants. So what you can see here, here's the nymph, and they back the sand in has to, be to the just sand. Right. Fine grain, soft. For this crafty critter to rig a trap that will make catching a meal a slam dunk. And he digs this wonderful little pit, he or her. And they're actually really quite meticulous sure enough, in the way they go about an it. an ant slips into his ditch. Now we think the ant is doomed, right? But the ant doesn't want to die, it's going to want to get out. It tries to escape, but the ant lion larva doesn't give up that easily. The ant lion literally pelts the ant with sand and gravel to have it fall back down. He pummels the ant with sand, just as it's about to get out of there. No matter what the ant does, it's doomed to slide back into the jaws of death. And then, of course, the ant lion grabs it, pulls it under the sand, and literally sucks mm -hmm. the life juices from it. Don't you love the natural world? So what I've been talking about is movie monsters. And it's been in the context of being creative and that proverbial creativity monster that's in the closet. But, you know, and, and we've taken a walk through a bit of history, and hopefully I've shown you that you can find sources of creativity or that even these fantastic movie monsters have sources of creativity that can literally be found in your backyard. So 
this thing, this creativity, we should really put a big X through this question mark. Because creativity is not, it doesn't have to be this new idea, right? It's about finding an inspiration in the world around you and making it tangible. Thank you for your time.